So the notion of a robot that can actually learn and plan, if not necessarily think creatively, is of course one reason that developments in this field do uh, arouse some concern and some worry as well as curiosity. Will artificial intelligence not only surpass but also suppress us? And Pippa Mangram, uh, in a way, presaged uh, the rest of my introduction by saying this doesn't have to be about man versus machine. It's premised very much on the idea that robots are autonomous actors and it's them or us. But of course, some of the most exciting work in robotics seeks to overcome that dichotomy and create man and machine. And that is exactly where we go now in our next presentation. It is on bionics, and it's entitled Blurring Science Fiction and Reality, the Future of Bionics. And it will be delivered by the co-founder of a company that has won multiple awards for its quest to create bionic limbs for amputees that are affordable, useful, and very cool. <laughs> Open Bionics has been named by Fast Company and Bloomberg as one of the most innovative robotic companies in the world, and it's a great Pleasure to, to welcome its co-founder and COO, Samantha Payne. Hi. Hello. Thank nice you to very see much. you again. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the perfect setup for what I'm about to talk to you about because um, Pippa mentioned how localized 3D printing is really going to change manufacturing, and how robotics and humans are coming ever closer together. So my company, Open Bionics, is a perfect case study of that. Um, so I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer at Open Bionics, and I'm also Wired Magazine's innovation fellow. And today I'm here to share with you um, our story of innovation over the past three years, how we are dramatically reducing the cost of a, of a very exclusive medical device that has a lot of healthcare providers very excited. Um, we're also using science fiction to inspire people with disabilities. So Open Bionics is here to create and democratize um, assistive devices that enhance the human body. There are hundreds of millions of people around the world who suffer from some form of mobility limitation, um, and we're here to build the robotic assistive devices for those people. But most importantly, our devices are accessible and they're affordable. And we're starting with the bionic hand. Something that's quite special about us is that not only are we focusing on price, we also want to turn people with disabilities into superheroes. But before I delve into science fiction, um, let me explain the problem. There are over 11 million amputees around the world, and when we started this journey three years ago, um, we ran lots of research and found that the majority of amputees used hooks or cosmetic hands. This is literally Victorian technology being given out by hospitals in 2017. Um, so Bionic, advanced bionics do exist, but they're incredibly expensive, and so the majority of amputees didn't have access to them. Um, the other problem with prosthetics and bionic limbs was that they weighed too much because of the battery and the motors. Um, they didn't look very appealing. There was sort of no design thought to them. And for children, um, the fitting process was really invasive and kind of traumatic uh, from a clinical perspective. Um, and also, kids couldn't even get bionic hands, even if they had tons of money. Um, a multi-grip, advanced bionic hand for a child just doesn't exist because they don't make them small enough, because kids grow really quickly, so it'd be too expensive. So there was this huge opportunity um, to create bionic limbs that were affordable, advanced, um, that were really inspiring to wear, and that weren't a pain to fit and have measured. This is a snapshot of the current state of prosthetic limbs. Um, you have the really advanced bionics that have pre-programmed multiple grip modes. These bionic limbs cost anywhere between £30,000 and £60,000. So that's the price of a sports car for one hand. And then on the other side of the scale, we have the enable hand. I'm sure you've probably seen these in the news. In fact, on one of the first pages of this book is a 3D printed mechanical hand made by this group. Um, it's free, it's open source, um, but it doesn't offer much functionality. So um, over the past three years, we've managed to develop an 
advanced bionic limb that comes under the price point of £5,000. This limb offers the same functionality of the market leaders, but we've managed to redu radically reduce the cost. We've also changed how the fitting process works. So at the moment, if you were to lose a hand, you would go to your hospital. The clinician would take a plaster cast of your limb. You would then wait three months before you got your prosthetic device. If you're a child, the likelihood is, is that you've already outgrown it by the time you're given it by your doctor, and then you have to go through that process again. It's quite invasive and time-consuming, including multiple trips. So we've decided to use new technologies, such as 3D scanning. So this 3D scanning technology is, is in its infancy. At the moment, you attach a 3D scanner to the back of an iPhone. I can take a 3D scan of your limb in less than a minute and then produce a custom socket in less than a day. So what currently takes the medical industry three months, I can produce in two days with a 3D scanner and a 3D printer. Which leads me to the other big innovation, 3D printing. Um, we've just passed uh, bi our biomedical testing tests for medical, device medical devices using 3D printed filament. So 3D printing is, is going to be a huge innovation in healthcare for personalized medical devices. The cool thing about 3D printing is that you can print multiple materials at the same time and multiple colors. Um, you can print anywhere. And we use FDM printers. So these aren't these giant 3D printers that you see in factories that are very, very expensive. We use FDM, off-the-shelf, commercially available printers. We just stack them. So we have a print farm in our lab in Bristol, printing these hands all the time. Um, which leads me to, to my next point. Um, once we brought down the cost and we added the extra functionality, we wanted to change what these bionic limbs could look like. So we decided to turn to the Walt Disney Company and begin a collaboration with them. And we have decided to turn children with limb differences into bionic superheroes. So could you imagine being born without a hand? You're a young child, and you turn up to school one day with a hook. Can you imagine the alienation you're probably going to experience in the playground? We hear about these experiences all the time from young children. So we really wanted to change what it meant to have a disability for these young kids. Now, when you go into school with an Iron Man bionic hand, you don't have a weakness. You have something that's super cool. So I'm really excited to show you our first uh, product range for young children. We have the Iron Man bionic hand, the Disney Frozen bionic hand, and the Star Wars lightsaber bionic hand. And the cool thing about these is that they're not just 3D renders. We've actually built them. These are the first two bionic superheroes, Avengers Sydney and Jedi Logan. These devices have functionality that currently don't exist anywhere um, in, in, medical, in the medical industry. So you can see Logan here is performing a tripod grip to pick up a small object. And here he's using a full fist. So he has full control over his fingers, and he's choosing which fingers to move to pick up which object. Logan is 10, and he was born without a hand. And this was the first time he got to use a bionic limb. Um, he also got, <laughs> thanks. He, um, he got really into character and was pretending to like force choke his sister, but he didn't mean it. <laughs> and here is Sydney, um, another child that we fitted. Sydney is 11, and here she's using a pinch grip um, to manipulate an object. So these, these grips are considered advanced functionality. One of the major challenges in robotics is recreating the, the capabilities of the human hand. We all take it for granted, the dexterity that we have, um, and just being able to perform a pinch grip point do a thumbs up is actually a huge life-changing thing for a young person who was born without a limb or an adult who loses a limb in an accident. Which brings me um, to our adult range. These aren't just for children, of course. So we teamed up with an award-winning video games com company called Edios Montreal. Uh, they make a game called DSX. This is a cyberpunk video game world where um, Body augmentations are a choice. It's nothing to do with disability. It's just that 
that hand looks really good and I want it. So it's my choice to change my body and upgrade. I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> um, so this is the Titan arm. It's supposed to be a high fashion couture arm, something that wouldn't be a miss on a runway. And the DSX Adam Jensen arm, the really awesome thing about this arm is that this is an exact replica of the arm worn by the main character in the video game universe. So we are literally taking science fiction and building it into a reality by giving it to a person who loses a limb. The devices um, are it uses advanced robotics. So inside the arm, there are muscle sensors, also called EMG, for those who know. Um, so the amputee would push or squeeze their muscles in their arm, and that would tell the hand how to move. And depending on how they squeeze, they can use fingers individually. Um, the device is extremely lightweight. Because of the new materials that we're using, it's half the weight of existing devices, which makes it much more comfortable to wear every day. Um, and it's swappable, so the covers, are you can swap them out, so one day you could be Iron Man and the next day you could be a Jedi Knight. The other cool thing about um, these devices is that they light up. So we're also trying to sort of gamify this medical process. When you learn how to use a bionic limb for the first time, you have to do a go through a number of tests to, s to see that you can pick up small objects and big objects and heavy objects, so you know how to use the grips for different tasks. Um, to aid this process, we built in LEDs and sounds, so when Logan wears the lightsaber arm, he can choose to be Luke Skywalker or he could be Yoda. He could then thrash his arm around and the lights would blinker just like a lightsaber would, and it would make the crashing sounds of a lightsaber. We've done all this to sort of improve the clinical experience of the child and to increase adoption rates so that they wear them more often and they enjoy the whole experience of their disability. <laughs> this, I just wanted to include that because um, Tilly is 10 years old, and she lost both of her hands to meningitis when she was a toddler. And she had never used a device like this before. I was just filming on my iPhone, and I found it amazing how quickly she found it um, to be able to control the device, pick up something, and actually use it for the first time, even if she looks, does look a little bit guilty there. <laughs> um, the reason why we've made so many big innovations in the past three years, and come such a long way in a very old industry is because we believe in co-design. Every innovation that we have made came from working with an amputee. So in the beginning, there was two of us. Um, we, we were not just robotics engineers sat in a lab trying to figure a solution for a problem that we had no experience of. Um, it was really important for us to work directly with the people who actually experienced the real world um, problem. So we would test with amputees, and for every new idea we'd have, we would take the idea to amputees, and most importantly, the amputees would bring their ideas to us. They would tell us about their optimum designs, what kind of battery life they wanted, wh how, how weighty the device felt, and how soft they wanted the materials to fill on their arms. What was really interesting that came out of all of these amputee workshops was the fact that none of them wanted to recreate the human hand. They wanted to design their own limbs. They wanted their limbs to be an expression of their personality. Bionic limbs should be thought of as a wearable technology. It's something that you have to wear every day, but it also shows off who you are. And if you have a robotic limb, What's to say that it has to function just like a human hand? You get to add to your body, you get to augment your body. So why not add a smartphone? Why not build in a smartwatch? Why not have a USB fingertip? fingertip? Um, why not build in a drawer compartment so you can keep your keys? All of, these, all of these ideas came from amputees, and this is the future of bionics. This is what we're working on. We're working on superhuman features um, for bionic limbs. And again, with every design idea that came out of these workshops, we would build and test and reiterate with a number of amputees. 
And what enabled us to do that faster was open sourcing all of our designs. So we share our 3D files and all of our software online for free. Institutions around the world have downloaded our work and used it as a platform to progress the technology. What's really awesome about this open network is that these innovators feed back their research into the community. So we are all working together globally much faster to prosthetic technology that is much better for everyone. And it's not just institutions and researchers who are using our work. Um, this is Taylor. He lost his limbs in Afghanistan. And he found our work online, downloaded his hand at home, 3D printed it in his garage, and then started innovating, started designing his own features. Um, because he wanted a bionic limb that was more of his own and was lighter. Um, people all around the world have been developing with us for the past three years. These are just some pictures of um, devices that, early devices that we shared and people built. Over the past three years, we've won multiple awards for engineering and innovation. Um, most of this is because of our work in robotics. Um, we've been um, highlighted and recognized by Fast Company, and really importantly for us, um, the amputee community, we've won Prosthetic Innovation Awards, we've won a um, Healthcare Innovation Award with the National Health Service in the UK, which um, means that we get to do a clinical trial with the NHS with 10 children this month. And I started the company with my co-founder, Joel, who is a robotics engineer. And we have a very fast-growing team of robotics and product design engineers in Bristol at the Bristol Robotics Lab. And we're looking for collaborations. Um, we really want to move this technology forward fast. Um, so we are always open to collaborating with researchers or people who experience the problem, or healthcare innovators, proc procurement directors. Um, and yeah, we're Open Bionics is here to, to build these robotic devices that are accessible and affordable. And I thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha Payne, and uh, lots of praise from the audience. Uh, loved what you do is here at the very, love what you do is here at the very top of the list. Uh, and just very briefly, if you would, please, I'll, I'll kind of bundle several of these into one question. What are your biggest obstacles? What would make the biggest difference for you in terms of boosting your ability to achieve your goals? Um, our biggest obstacle are sort of old medical industry sort of pathways. So in the NHS in England, um, the, the trust is all sort of split up into counties, and you have to get a, approval from each trust to be able to prescribe these devices to patients. We're working with a trust in Bristol um, who are obviously really excited about the device because in the NHS, there isn't anything like this available because it's far too expensive for them to prescribe to patients. Um, so I guess the number one thing would be healthcare advocates um, in the US and across Europe, doctors and clinicians who say, okay, I've seen this, I've seen the evidence, I've looked at the data, this is good for our patients, there's nothing available like this for patients currently, let's try and push it through these old systems and get it adopted. Thank you very much. That addressed a number of the questions on the list and you were so quick, so very briefly, one last question, your biggest inspiration. Oh my God, that's a hard one. Um, biggest inspiration. I guess my biggest inspiration is all of the founders who came before me and were told, oh, that's a crazy idea, um, that, that you're never going to be able to do that. Because in the beginning, we were told constantly, like, oh, that's never going to pass this bio testing. You can't get that material. It won't be safe on skin. And um, you know, there's a lot of critics. It's very easy to say no to someone. It's easy to say, oh, that's not going to work. Um, it's a lot harder to go out there and do it and fail and, and learn and push forwards. So my biggest inspiration are all the founders who came before me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Samantha Payne. Thanks.